one here is the study of uh, uh, Chaka Bey, who is the first Turkish admiral who lived in 1081. This study has been done by our good friend, Mr. Oz Aydemir, who is the president of Turkish Nautical Arch uh, Architecture uh, uh, Foundation. So, of course, Ataturk, who is the founder of the modern Turkish Navy and the books. And also we have an article bank. We have a, a lot of articles here. So uh, we have already put all, all these uh, articles and the list of books to our university's websites. Uh, I should say that uh, making research on the area of maritime history is very important. We uh, believe this by heart. One of our job is to work, is to look at back to our history to find new architects, new documents and evaluate them. Uh, why we are doing this? Uh, we are doing this uh, to build up a new and sound future. This is our aim. Of course, in research, there is risk. You may not find anything, but if you find something, it is something. So it is worth to try. So I'm sure it's a good start. The center will work very hard. In the university, we have started the series of our Congresses in the year 2012. First, it was an erosion maritime history Congress in Turkey. That was a big Congress, not like this big one. 107 researchers uh, has participated, have participated. Uh, and then the second one was in Russia, St. Petersburg. That was on maritime history of Russia. Then, of course, Venice during the time of Professor Maria Piapedani. Now she passed away. She was the member of our scientific committee. Uh, then Cyprus, of course, maritime history of Cyprus. And again, here in the university, in the history of shipbuilding, it was a good Congress. Now we are at the stage of preparing the proceedings of our Congress, History of Shipbuilding, Professor Dejanira Kuto, who, who, who is our uh, keynote speaker today. By the way, hello to her. And then uh, Professor Philip Castro is editing the, uh, the proceedings. It's gonna be a very nice, uh, valuable book. It's the university's gift to the world of maritime history, believe me. Then another one was at the Monaco. It was the uh, history of measurement of world oceans together with the uh, IHO, International Hydrographic Office and Monaco Oceanographic Museum. This event is the seventh event, history of Eastern Mediterranean. The eighth event is coming in August. That is the history of Black Sea. The majority will be Russian art. A lot of prominent professors from Russia is going to participate. For example, Professor Postikov from Moscow University and also Professor Medizade from Louisiana University. They're gonna be the keynote in our Black Sea Conference. Uh, of course, if the pandemic ends, uh, our live face-to-face -face Congress will come in Bodrum the subject will be the Dragut. Today, we have very important two keynote speakers, Professor Dejanara Kuto, she's my friend. She's the member of scientific committee. Uh, she, she, she is with us since we have started. And the other keynote speaker is uh, Professor Blent Suzer. And also we have very important eight speakers also. Uh, we have Professor Ali Denizli. He's, he's going to talk to us about the 
the Aegean history, the, the Turkish Greek confrontation uh, in, in the process of uh, uh, the historical process. Also, Professor Uli Kesar, he's going to talk about some intelligence matters in the Mediterranean, in the history. Of course, uh, Associated Professor Ergin Gemiral, he is my friend, and he is going to talk about uh, maritime strategic, uh, history of uh, maritime strategy in the Mediterranean. Of course, afternoon period, uh, uh, Arnold Casola, who is my uh, good friend from Malta, uh, he's the, uh, he's the uh, writer of this beautiful book, Solomon the Magnificent and Malta, 1565. He's a, uh, uh, he, he has done this book in Turkey by using the Ottoman sources from Ottoman archives. Uh, and maybe uh, Arnold, if you're hearing me, why not? Maybe uh, we can do another one in Malta uh, after the pandemic. What do you say? Okay. After uh, uh, him, we have uh, our uh, another friend, Blant Aru. He's going to talk about Law of Sea, Ottomans, period. Uh, Eja Yüksel, uh, she's going to talk about Suez uh, shipyard and the Ottoman archive documents. Recep Kirekli, he's going to talk. Uh, smuggling in, in the history in, in that area, Egypt and Tripoli, uh, according to the Ottoman sources in the, in the late Ottoman period. The last speaker will be Jemile Yamur, and she will talk about the uh, Straits and also the Mediterranean in the history. At the end, I will wrap up and I will do the closing remarks. So I will meet you again at the end. This is right now, uh, all I say is this, uh, I wish you all success. Uh, Funda. Thank you, dear Edward Latach, thank you for your contributions. Now I would like to invite rector, our rector of Piri Reis University, Professor Dr. Oral, Oral Erdogan, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you hear? Yes, we hear you. Dear participants, 2013 was the peer race year declared by UNESCO due to the 500th anniversary of the peer race world map dated 1513. What a nice that our university established the, Mar established the Maritime History Research Center at that year. Since its start, uh, the center has organized several international meetings so far. And today, welcome to our international symposium on Eastern Mediterranean maritime history. Well, I'm not the expert of history, but I was born in Mediterranean. My childhood passed in those beautiful waters. The history teacher in high school asked me in the oral exam, uh, who wrote the book of Bahriye? I answered, Pirilis. Second question was followed. What's the national ideal for Turkey? I said, maritime in high school times. After the high school, I studied in the naval architecture and marine engineering at the university. I trained on the ship named Akdeniz, Mediterranean in English. I worked for the Turkish Maritime Organization. In the meantime, years passed and Peer Reis University was established. And after a while, the task fell on me. Dear participants, in the summer of my half century life, I started to read the book of Mediterranean by Peer Reis and I still continue. I try to better understand the depths of history like an ocean on every page of the book. 
Today, we have the opportunity to listen, discuss, and learn a very good topic from distinguished academicians. While thanking you all for your participation, I wholeheartedly believe that the symposium will be very productive. Thank you, Chairman. Dear Professor Dr. Oral Erdogan, thank you very much for your uh, contributions. Now I would like to invite the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Tamer Kran, please. Thank you, Funda Hanım. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Distinguished academicians, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be a part of this international symposium and very, very honored to, be, uh, to meet you today. We all would love to, if we could, have our meeting face-to-face -face at our seaside campus, campus. I hope next time we will welcome you there. Dear participants, as the chairman of the Chamber of Shipping, and the chairman of the board of trustees of Piri Reis University. I would like to share my views briefly about the importance of maritime affairs and of course, maritime history for us. The main actors that benefit economically from shipping are ship owners, shippers, shipyards, financial institutions, marinas, yacht yachting sector, ports, ports and terminals, suppliers, supervisors, consultants, banker companies, insurance companies, marine lawyers, sea tourism related companies, stevedores, forwarders, seafarers, etc. In short, almost all people benefit from cargo carried by sea. Thanks to globalization, the expected increase in international trade and capital movements in the post pandemic period will trigger a further increase in the inter interdependence of economies. It is expected that the maritime markets will be much more positively affected by this flourish. The share of maritime transport in global trade, where the pandemic plays a major role, has reached to 90%. Although the share of maritime transport has increased as a percentage, the amount of cargo transported, which was approximately 12 billion tons in 2019, decreased by 3.6% and was realized as 11.5 billion tons in 2020. The gradual increase in the world population will trigger an increase in production, agriculture, and industry. With the increase in energy need, uh, in, in energy need Parallel to this advancement, it is expected that the business volume in the shipping and logistics will also increase. Since the most economical and large scale transportation in the world is carried out, carried out by ships, maritime trade has a very important share in the system. Although there has been a small decrease in volume during the pandemic uh, time, all reputable organizations predict that there will be significant growth in shipping in 2021 and beyond. In terms of seas surrounding Turkey, an acceleration is expected in the Black Sea trade area, as well as uh, the trade in the Mediterranean and the Aegean routes in short term. Based on the fact that technology must be followed very well, it is considered that all ship owners, not a limited number, should read the transition process to new developments, such as autonomous ships, especially in the next 10 years. Dear academicians, the main route of maritime transport is formed between production and consumption centers. The Mediterranean, which is the common inner sea of Europe, Africa, and Asia in a way, is connected to the countries of the continent of America. The Istanbul Strait and the Suez Canal, which are among the eight most important passages of the world as critical passages, are of great importance. We all experience the economic and political developments in the eastern part of Mediterranean, especially nowadays. So unfortunately, we are watching serious problems. In fact, if we try to understand our history better, it will be much easier for us to come up with more rational and optimal solutions. 
Besides the strategic position of the Eastern Mediterranean in today's politics, the history of the same area is keeping its even growing importance for Turkish Republic. Today, the country is having a very certain territory in dimensioned geography, which was the, fir- the very first safe haven for Turks since very early uh, 1000s. Starting from Chaka Bey, who was at the uh, fore of the first Turkish Navy, the northeast of the Med- Eastern Mediterranean began to be Turkish. Due to these powerful steps towards establishing the sea power in the west coast of Turkey, the roots for Turkish history in the Mediterranean has been released, released. Successive activities of following commanders, principality leaders, and finally Ottoman sultans in the territory continued to expand and affected the regional history deeply as much as its own historical development. On the other hand, Eastern Mediterranean has been keeping its vital position in the world history for thousands of years due to its varied institutional benefits in generating first civilizations. Mediterranean, when became as a whole, thanks to Roman Empire, the area became the center for early early sea trade and at international level. The maritime economy was shifted from waterside only to far distance trading, which was not even imagined by early civilizations. As directing and tempting world powers, the Eastern Mediterranean has enormous impact on world history. However, it affects Turkish history even further due to common fate of being neighbors for centuries. Research and studies on the Eastern Mediterranean, to some extent, are dealing with Turkish history. It is not possible to separate Turkish history from Eastern Mediterranean history in order to look at macro perspective towards historical facts. Almost all presentations, it is always said that the subject has gained importance in recent years. But believe you me, the Eastern Mediterranean will always remain important as always. Here here in online meeting today, we will find the opportunity to both refresh and increase our knowledge from very valuable presentations. I would like to thank our university director, Professor Erdogan, the retired force commander and our board of trustees member, Admiral Attach, the members of the scientific board, and those who contributed to this organization. I would also like to express my gratitude to keynote speakers, Professor Kuto and Dr. Sözer, and to all presenters. I wish this symposium to be very uh, fruitful. Thank you. Dear Mr. Kran, thank you very much for your valuable comments on today's and future industry, together with the connections of the history. Now it is time to end the opening remarks and invite Professor Dr. Dejanira Kuto, our first first keynote speaker. Please, before that, let me give a brief introduction about Professor Dr. Kuto. Dejanira Kuto is professor of early modern Portuguese overseas at the School of Advanced Studies, Sorbonne, Paris. She is currently associated researcher of the French Institute of Anatolian Research, and a member of the International Association of Maritime History. Her research focuses on Portuguese, Ottoman, Arab, Indian political, economic, and cultural relations from the Mediterranean to Southeast Asia. She has published widely more than 100 articles and several books on cross-cultural history, diplomacy, cartography, maritime warfare, port cities, and merchant networks in the Mediterranean and in the Indian Ocean. Among her recent publications are Ampiron Marsh, L'Europe et la Chine, 16 e 19 e siècle, Le Long de la Negociation Pro Historian, Sea Power, Technology and Trade Studies in Turkish Maritime History, we are delighted to have you here with us, Professor Kuta. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mrs. Songur. Uh, thank you to all of you. I hope you hear me well. 
And first of all, I'm very honored and very pleased uh, to be invited, uh, although in difficult conditions. Uh, this should be a presidential one, but cannot be, as you know, uh, because of these uh, epidemics. Um, but no matter, we are together, we are getting together and continue our work. And I think this is the most important. So I would like to express my gratitude to the University of uh, Piri Reis uh, in the person of uh, his, uh, its rector, Professor Oral Erdogan, uh, to express also my gratitude to uh, Mr. Tamek Kuran, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, uh, and of course to my dear friend and colleague, um, Admiral Metina Tach, and also to express my gratitude to not only the members of the scientific committee, but to all who had been involved in the organization of this event, uh, especially to uh, Mrs. Ms. Funda uh, Sogur, to all our speakers. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you because I have a PowerPoint. And of course, you, you will not see me, you see only the screen, but uh, it's not a problem <laughs> because the important, it's the content of what I'm going uh, to say. So I'm going to tell me if it's okay. If you are seeing my screen, um, you should be. OK, do you have it? Now we are seeing both your presentation and you. And yeah, and I'm going to put my PowerPoint. Yeah, so now you have the screen, yes? Yes, and you, yeah. we have you. OK, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I will start. Uh, historiographically, when one thinks on the maritime history of the Mediterranean in the early modern era and on, of the Ottoman Mediterranean or included in the Ottoman sphere of influence, renowned studies come to mind penned by Colin Imber, Daniel Panzak, Colin A. Wood, to name only a benchmark of pioneering works. Subsequently, many other relevant contributions have emerged, like the ones of Nicolas Vatin and Jill Weinstein, Emra Safa Gurkan, Joshua White, a very interesting thesis defended in Stanford on 2018, on the Eastern Mediterranean, Tobias Graf, Anne Brogini, Daniel Erzen Schoen, Wolfgang Kaiser, Fering Tot, Guillaume Calafat, Maria Fusaro, Emilio Sola, Ayri Gökshin Uskurei, Idris Bostan, Noel Malcolm, etc., etc. Edited with Maria Pia Pedani and Professor Feza Gunnar Gun and published in 2014, the proceedings of the IMS Congress held in Istanbul in 2013, I remember uh, and I remind 57 articles allowed to sweep a number of microhistory case studies in the fields of social, economic, and technological history related to maritime history as well as nautical archeology span of the Eastern Mediterranean. Many other materials have been released in the second Congress in St. Petersburg. The third IAM Congress in Tuzla in 2019, uh, 18, and various conferences organized by the IMS in Venice, in 2013, Cyprus 2015, Lisbon 2016, and Monaco uh, 2018. The proceedings of Venice and Lisbon have been published by the late Maria Pia Pedani in the journal, journal Hilal, yes, 
And by the Navy Academy of Portugal in 2018, uh, a bilingual edition uh, devoted to Piri Reis, respectively. The Tuzla Congress proceedings on shipbuilding are currently under editing, as Admiral Letach uh, just told you. As a matter of fact, we only miss the editing of one paper. All the others are prepared. The manuscript with introduction is prepared uh, for the editor. And of course, uh, we are still waiting uh, for the forewords of Professor Erdogan, uh, um, uh, Mr. Kiran, and also uh, Admiral Atach. But anyway, we are uh, on the track and we are almost finished. This is why it was chosen in the present keynote to move beyond generalities on the history of the East Mediterranean and focus, and focus on a case study which highlights stimulating methodological approaches on the early modern history of the region. Indeed, despite the fact that many scholarly pieces still favor a classical political history revolving around the 1516 Ottoman maritime expansion in the Mediterranean, the warfare against Venice, the Habsburg and the papacy, the last decades have seen the emergence of new research teams in social and cultural history related, for instance, to the study of Mediterranean crossings and the inner sea permeable boundaries and borders moving beyond the symbolic line separating Islam and Christendom. The clear identities carried by micro-history studies in the cross-cultural perspective invite one to look at Mediterranean history as another level rather than the geopolitical one, and to tell a different story than the one of a clash of empires that is still here and there presented as a kind of clash of civilizations. This may lead us to ask a crucial question. How much do empires matter? Yet an important role of non-state economic and social institutions and the way empires dealt with them is to be emphasized. See, for instance, John Elliott's seminal article of 1992 on the composite monarchies. In other words, one has to study how the empires, whether the Habsburgs, whether the Ottoman Empire, made a contracting or associating parts with known institutional entities, thus composing a kind of composite trans-imperial configurations. And my point is this idea of composite trans-imperial configurations. From this point of view, the Mediterranean remains a privileged area for innovative research. Because of its geography and history, it favored since antiquity human exchanges, migrations, and circulations of many social categories. Anonymous merchants, interpreters, soldiers, prisoners, converts, slaves, religious individuals, left behind poor people. To these bottom categories, one could easily add the ones of privateering and piracy, often nourished by the previous ones. Indeed, although piracy is considered 
is called Cedret. And sorry, I have a problem with the moving. Ah, sorry, it was a little bit blocked. Um, is considered a classical subject in Mediterranean history since the seminal works of Fernand Brodel, Jack Ayres, and Salvatore Bono. It conceals a, indeed a large number of potentialities, whether in the history of social practices, logistics, and tactics to capture individuals, economy of ransoming, in economic history, participation in trade flows, in the history of maritime, common and religious law, Christian or Islamic, or in the history of ecology and environment. One of the most promising areas of study in social history connected to piracy remains the history of information, e.g intelligence on land and on sea, privateering in the early modern year, whether in the service of political powers, such as the Habsburg, the Sublime Port, the Italian states, or undertook by autonomous individualities and individuals could not have developed without strong information networks. In other words, intelligence may be considered as a new diplomatic history of early modern Mediterranean. I stress because it's really important. Around the middle of the 16th century, when the Ottomans faced the Imperials in the Mediterranean, each political power ruled its own information networks which, as we'll see further, could occasionally intertwine during certain campaigns or when dealing with recruitments. The Hispanic structures in the service of Emperor Charles V and Philip II of Spain operated from the cities and ports of the Kingdom of Naples. And by the way, I want you to drive drive please uh, uh, your attention to this very uh, recent book from Noel Malcolm, uh, which deals with all these social categories, which are so important in the history of Mediterranean, which I have been uh, dealing uh, with in the 16th century. Okay, so I have always, okay. Around, um, so during this time, the services of Imperial Charles V and Philip II of Spain operated from the cities and ports of the Kingdom of Naples, including Sicily. And their action extended to the African shores of the Mediterranean, notably to Tunisia, where they sometimes interfered with the networks of Ottoman corsairs and privateers. The situation of the Kingdom of Naples deserves to be emphasized. Very exposed to Barbary piracy, it suffered from several ailments, social tensions, impoverishment of the populations and chronic deficit of cash. Nonetheless, repairs and construction of new fortifications along the coast were carried out simultaneously between 1530 and 1540s. However, the plan to build a large fleet against the Barbary Corsairs were, was abandoned after having been started in 1530, 1531. It was not until 1543 that four galleys were built. These shortcomings made military resistance against the Ottoman advance in the central Mediterranean uncertain, which the conquests of Modon in Finsetis Tru and Patras had only confirmed. Other dangers lurked in the Naples as well. A 1560 
report to Philip II of Spain insisted on the need to fortify, to fortify Brindisi constantly under attack by Albanian pirates from Valona and Uccini, the Uskoks. The Uskoks. The difference, the difference of Naples and the reorganization of its land and sea armed forces, in particular on the most exposed areas of the coast, that of the land of Otranto, Terra do Tranto, therefore depended heavily on the management of secret information collected more or less method, uh, method, methodically. Other filtered by Venice, the most important European intelligence center in the 16th century, the anonymous posts blend by local agents known as Avizi di Constantinopoli, punctuated the fluctuations of Neapolitan politics. From 1539 to 1547, the Spanish service in Naples were directed by Don Rodrigo Nino, Don Diego de Hurtado de Mendoncia, imperial ambassador in, in Venice, brother of Lopo Hurtado de Mendoza, succeeded him. Around 1530s, two spying or network intelligence structures are at work in the Kingdom of Naples from the Christian side. That of the Aragonese Don Fernando Alarcón, Commander General of the Imperial Troops, and that of Don Alfonso Granai Castriota, Marquis of Atripalda. The Alarcon network had relatively limited sources of information. Its agents were mainly reporting Venice, Ragusa, and in the land of Otranto. Frequenting merchant circles linked to maritime trade, they sometimes benefited from the help of the Venetian Bele of Corfu. The presence of one of Alarcon spies is, however, reported in Sofia during a mission to investigate the composition of Suleiman's army. On the other hand, the range of action of Atripalda's agents was much wider and their social background more diverse. Don Alfonso recruited more at the local level among men well-rooted in southern villages with vast networks of family solidarities. Of Albanian origin, Atripalda, Grand nephew of George Castriota, Aka Skanderberg, who led the well known rebellion against the Ottomans in the 15th century, 1443 1468, was appointed governor of the land of Otranto and Bari in 1519 and generally residing in Lecce, Puglia, where his family, family received privileges and lordships. He therefore had no difficulty in recruiting its agents from various circles from among his large clientele of Greeks, Slavs, and Albanians. All were able to move easily within the Ottoman Empire. They were sometimes reported in Istanbul, sometimes in Cairo. Claiming the heritage of his prestigious ancestor, Don Alfonso Atripalda saw himself as a model of resistance to the Ottomans. Directing an intelligence network was perfectly suited to the mission which he, which, with which he believed himself invested. See his letter to Charles V of July 14, 1532. Following the examples of other Western information networks, the family dimension was also very present in the Atripalda system. For example, when he was away from Napoli, his nephew, Don Piero Castriota, took over the management. This network remained active after the death of Alfonso Atripalda. Its section is still reported in 1560, when the correspondence of the Duke of Alcala, Viceroy of Naples, delivers in several avisi of Istanbul, the names of his agents. The network used the best passageways, 
between the land of Otranto and the Ottoman Empire and vice versa. So this very important um, uh, route, maritime route. And as a Simancas document entitled Con Juan Maria Renzo que había de pasar a Turquía also provides information on these uh, intelligence routes. Another interesting circuits extended to Cyprus and to the island of Kio, where Morjovo, for example, Portugal had a factory at the end of 15th century and where the ambassador of Portugal in Istanbul in the 1540s had his family residence. The documentation provides valuable information of the networks functioning, including salaries paid to agents. Lorenzo Mignati, for example, was assassinated in 1566, but Lobello and Dimo Mignate were still paid in the 1566 and 67. The information was collected and transmitted to the secretary of the Naples Kingdom, to the secretaries of the Viceroy and other members of the Concilio Collaterale in charge of the postal service. In 1532, Viceroy Don Pedro de Toledo brought with him to Naples Antonio da Puente, an officer in charge of the cipher, in charge, of course, of breaking the codes. In terms of agent salaries, Venice was the European state that paid its spies the best. Considered of inferior quality compared to that of Venice, the information collected by the agents in Naples was remunerated in a more modest way. However, we must remain cautious and be careful not to generalize in the service of Naples, but without being able to say with certainty whether it belonged to the Alarcon network or to the Altripaldo one. Juan Campos, the agent probably of Albanian origin, was uh, received instructions for mis a mission in the Ottoman territory in 1535, and we know how much he was paid, what amount. At the same time, another agent, a Venetian, Pietro Michele, on the return for, from a secret mission in Syria, acknowledged receipt of 300 zakinis paid by the Council of Ten. We can get an overview of the remuneration of the spies of the Hispanic networks between 1561 and 1574, to, to the, thanks to the list edited by Enrique Garcia Hernan in 2003. So we can say to sum up that in the years of 1568-1570, it's interesting in political terms, the Spanish crown had around 300 informants in its service in the Mediterranean and spent about 5,000 ducats a year on retribution. Even some of these spies were probably not paid in cash. Okay, we have an identification of the members of the different networks. And we know what place Professor? Uh, I think we are having some technical problems right now. Özgür Hocam, do you see any? I think she has a connection problem. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Um, we can wait some couple minutes. Maybe she will be able to reconnect. Uh, I think she's online. I can oh. see her. Professor now. Kuto, are you here? Professor? Uh, can, can, you, can you unmute yourself, please, Professor? Professor Kuto, we are not able to hear you. And now you hear me? Uh, yes, yes yeah. we do. Okay. So, 
Um, we could go on uh, on this question of the uh, imperial networks, but I'm going to move to the second part of this uh, presentation and asking uh, what was happening on the Barbary and Ottoman side. From a social point of view, some intelligence practices, and this is quite interesting, were quite identical at the time to the Habsburg ones. They all were also marked by a strong social cosmopolitanism. And I have to move again to my images. So by a strong cosmopolitanism. Let us look at the documents from the years 1562-1563 relating to the network of Turgut rays in Sicily. Insofar as this privateer was the subject of a number of works, some very recent works, and there is no need to go back on his bi biography on, or its already known activities, activities since his installation in the island of Gerba, followed by establishment in Tripoli. What interests us is to be, is to know that he animated an intelligence network whose activities are highlighted in 1562 during a period punctuated by occasional military operations. So between the impressing victory of Gerba with Piala Pasha and the siege of Malta, of course. A document of Estado Napolis entitled Locusie e Sacado del Renegat que se tomó en Saragossa de Sicilia provides details on the activity of his informants on the service then of Turgut race. It should be read together with his Relacion de Coloca Echo Dragut, uh, what Dragut did. And the document contains the testimony of a renegade detained and questioned by the Habsburg administration in Naples. So in July 1559, Turgut Reis was operating in Neapolitan and Sicilian waters from its base in Gerba. He boarded eight Sicilian boats there. In July 61, near the Lipari Islands, he inflicted a severe defeat on the seven Spanish galleys commanded by the Catalan uh, commander Guimaran, commander of the Sicilian fleet. Turgut come to besiege Naples the same summer of 1561 with 35 ships, forcing its governor, the Marquis of Tarifa, to seek assistance for Philip II. The ports of Genoa, Livorno, Reggio di Calabria and Croton, as well as several areas of the Adriatic were also hit. In the summer of 1562, the Pasha returned to Gerba in order to prepare new raids intended as a priority to replenish its stocks of wheat. He also was targeting Lagulet. The renegade whose testimony was recorded was an individual of Turgut's entourage, a certain Constantine named Mahmed after his conversion. In 1562, his master then in Tripoli sent him to investigate the defenses of Syracuse aboard a frigate well armed with artillery pieces. Constantine Mahmed, who claimed to have never been to Sicily, was accompanied by Mahmed, a former slave in galleys of Malta, who boasted of knowing Syracuse well. The two men were to report on the strength of the city walls the capability of their artillery and seek to obtain a maximum of information about his defenses. Equipped with 1,000 escudos, a crew of four Turks and five Christian slaves to be sold, they sailed together with a brigantine belonging to Turgut 
calling at Yerba, Sus, and Monastir. Before embarking, Turgut told Constantine they would later meet in Messina with a Greek named Joan, who had been married in that city. This Joan had been handled to Turgut by Mani Reis, a renegade from Trapani. Joan had the full confidence of Dragut, which had freed him earlier and had given him a ship. He was in charge of spying in Sicily on behalf of Turgut in a more or less permanent basis. And he was supposed to give accounts of his missions when he would be back to Tripoli, the logistic base of Turgut that had conquered the city in 1556. The interrogation of Constantine Mahmet also allows us to confirm that Turgut race was not the only Ottoman Corsair to have his own individual informants and networks, possibly part of a wider networks of other informants. So, for instance, Uluc Ali Reis, the famous Corsair administrator of Samos in 1550, Beller Bay of Alexandria in 1565, and Beller Bay of Algiers in 1568, a companion of Turbugut Reis, to whom Emilio Sola dedicated an interesting article published in our IMS volume, Sea Power Technology and Trade, possessed also his own intelligence network. Indeed, the interrogation of Konstantin Mehmet also provided some evidence regarding Uluc intelligence network. Uluc, after having sailed with two galleys and galliots, arrived in Trapani where he captured the vessel. It is embarked there, 10 miles from the city, together with the Genoese, whose identity is not known, and the renegade man raised the men from Trapani, both dressed on a Christian manner, while many waited out on a garden in the city outskirts, the Genoese in charge of visiting the city alone to gather information about the defense, had returned two hours later with a local inhabitant, apparently a friend of him, that was willing to provide strategic information to many race. The Genoese went back to the ship while race met a link with the inhabitant of Trapani, gathering a lot of strategic information that is referred in the document. Going back to Turgut Intelligence Work Network, the mission of Mehmet ended in failure. After calling as referred at Sus, Jerba and Monastir, his ship landed as planning on the coast near Syracuse in the scheduled place. The crew members, including uh, Ahmed and four other Turks were disembarked. Constantine was sent ashore to meet informants and Ahmed and the crew sailors awaited him also in the outskirts of Syracuse. But Constantine was recognized at the gates of the city by a soldier, a former slave in Tripoli, who immediately handled him to the Spanish authorities who arrested him and proceeded to his interrogation. The destiny of Mehmed, Constantine Mehmed, is not known. The document ends with a brief mention of Turgut's naval forces in that year, presumably recorded as a result of Constantine Mahmet's deposition. Therefore, we learn that Turgut rise at the fleet of 14 ships built in Tripoli, supplementing by four or five boats from other race. According to the same source, Germa that counted on a garrison of 80 Turks and Tripoli of 2,000, uh, uh, a consistent, a significant number. To conclude this brief overview, this circumscribed spying intelligence episodes provide a number of clues, not only on Turgut's network in the Mediterranean and its links with another intelligence Ottoman networks, the one of Uluc Ali Reitz, but shows 
especially, and I want to emphasize this point, that Mediterranean corsairs and privateers had abilities to deal with quite sophisticated intelligence operation at that time in early modern period, there's better explaining a part of their successes in maritime warfare. On a more general level, the recent studies of Joshua White or Emra Safagul Khan, who published uh, his PhD thesis in 2013, quoting extensively Spanish archival materials from Simancas, uh, which I did for this presentation, enable us to better grasp the extension of some other Mediterranean networks yeah. and their tight intertwining. The combined efforts of several works and several scholars working in these matters should shed more light on all these social practices related to the sea, thus enable us to scope, and I emphasize, I stress, a more nuanced history of the East Mediterranean, more bottom up and transnationally oriented, privileging the non-institutional functions and groups on edge of imperial powers, either Christian, either the Ottoman Empire, thus leading us to new approaches in social history according to the wider accepted international trend nowadays of what we call connected history, which means not only making a political classical history, but just seeking for interactions, circulations, trying to make a history on equal parts, who gives the same voice to the each of the regional or imperial or extra imperial uh, materials and sources and not in a ethnocentric approach of the historiography. Uh, so giving the voices to these people when I talk on these opening remarks about bottom uh, people, uh, these ca social categories that have not a real voice in the classical historiography dealing with the history of empires, which still much attached to the diplomatic history of battles and of military events, we have to move, we are moving beyond uh, this frame. And that's why I said that in this new approach, the history of information is an example. By instance, it's a way of making a new diplomatic history that doesn't rely only on treaties, on warfare, on battles, on uh, kingships, on su succession uh, kingships. Uh, so the social history of all the other mass that served and made history. And going back to the words of Ferdinand Brodel and also of in Algeric, uh, we they also, uh, all of these eminent histor historians stressed many years ago, and we must follow this path, that there's many categories in the history of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, we have to deal with and increasingly uh, our work on these matters. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Dear Professor Dr. Kuto, actually we thank you for uh, really stimulating uh, keynote speech, especially uh, about this 
both in the area, also on the Eastern Mediterranean, by several topics, both in economic history, social history, maritime warfare, as a, a mutual um, economic area to study on. And also for your, of course, special interest in Ottoman history. Mm. Uh, actually, you have shown us how the geography provides innovative research on human history, as I have seen right now. Yes, yes, of course. I was just uh, focusing on this area from southern Italy and Sicily and Tunisia, which is, okay, on the edge of central to east Mediterranean. But, of course, eastern Mediterranean, it's, uh, you know, geography. You know the great historian, French historian, um, Lucien Febvre, he said, the, the borders and the boundaries don't exist. What exists is the geography. Yes. <laughs> we make the boundaries, but the geography teaches us more realities than uh, what we created when we implemented the political borders. And the people that migrate beyond borders are showing us every day a reality of the geography that moves beyond what has been uh, determined by the political powers, because men, they don't know, they always move beyond borders. Exactly. Now, the Eastern Mediterranean, a perfect example for that. Perfect. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Nowadays, let's say the, the, the problems we are facing in the Mediterranean, when we're talking actually on a very crucial uh, problem, which is the one of the migration, it's showing the reality of the Mediterranean. It's that everything is intertwined in the Mediterranean. And that's what my presentation was trying to show, is that with the example of the intelligence networks, even the intelligence information networks were intertwined. The Ottomans were recruiting uh, Italians or Spanish, and the Spanish were also recruiting sometimes uh, Ottoman subjects. So uh, we, the connected history, it's the efforts to show that our history is a common history. And we are linked and bounded by the realities of history. So when we read the archives and the archive material, we have to, to, to be have present, to keep in mind the, 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 area, the reality that we are, that we form, which is a, a common shared history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now uh, it is time to start with session one, uh, which will be moderated by Dr. Shuhman Tepe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Songur. Uh, yes, we will now move on with session one. In this session, we have three speakers from three different universities, and we will have a question and answer period after the three presentations have been completed. Just as a note, I would like to remind that each speaker is allocated 20 minutes for the presentations, and I would also try to inform them when two minutes of their time is left. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Dr. Ali Denizli. He is joining us from Istanbul Rumeli University and his speech is gonna be on the magnificent strength of great Turkish Navy in the Aegean and threats to Turkish Navy of Greek and background countries in the historical process. Yes, Professor Denizli, you have the floor, sir. And uh, thank you, <clears throat> uh, getting you my voice. Yes, yes. Have a good day. It's good morning. I'm thanking to the uh, our commander, Admiral Metin Atac, uh, Rector Oral Erdogan, uh, Mr. Kran, and Professor Kutu uh, presented uh, good uh, things. Uh, I'm sharing my.
Okay, waiting the sharing. Okay, one minute. Yes, I'm the professor uh, in the uh, Rumelu University, International Relations, and uh, uh, I'm writing the history books. I have the, uh, this is the, my Cyprus book, uh, Landing on the Cyprus. And then the, I'm writing the Korean War books. Uh, so uh, I'm writing the Atatürk books about the uh, history. This is the, my Atatürk books. Uh, I'm the uh, second time, I'm the retired colonel. I work in the special forces, battalion commander and the brigade uh, and the second command and the special forces. I got the uh, scuba diving in the Navy. So uh, I'm the fishman. Uh, my presentation is the power, one minute, uh, the empire conquers Balkans and Istanbul burying the Eastern Roman Empire in the history, you know. When the uh, Anatolian Seljuk state expansion on the West, Turks conquered Ottoman Thessalonica, Turkish rule, 1431st. Uh, After then, Turkish uh, trade from the Mehmet time, the Ottoman naval history fully organized Ottoman Navy can only be seen in the period of Sultan Mehmet. The empire middle of the century, one of the uh, pictures, I'm going the pictures, it seemed to be most powerful state dominating the world. Policy in the West uh, won the great struggle uh, he had the, with the empire of Shalkin, uh, control of the old Mediterranean at that time. Christianity couldn't prevent all the North Africa after Morocco from failing under Ottoman rule. The Ottoman Navy wasn't permitted flying a bird in the Mediterranean under the rule of Barbaros. Can it fly a bird in the uh, Mediterranean? Uh, Turkish Navy while dominating these seas, you know. Most of the Greeks, the Turkish Muslim people, lost 100,000 lives in the capture of the islands, Crete Island, you know, these islands lost. But they developed on that state that the Greek merchant fleet ships in uh, 1821. Uh, the merchant ships, these Greeks, were already armed in the first weeks of the Greek uprising. The Ottoman state suddenly faced a fierce fleet in the Aegean. The Ottoman naval power, as the Ottoman state reduced the value it gave to naval power, their country was out of their hands and lost the Mediterranean. This is very important. Reduce the value it gave to naval power. You know, the Katerina put the Greek project that will destroy the sick man. And then they became the Constantinopolis. But very important side, the British and the Russian betrayal. British abandoned the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire. 1822, and started demanding the independence of the Greece, because uh, you know the, uh, some of the dates, uh, so the Britain destructed the Ottoman Empire, discredited by the British. Uh, our Turkish enemy is the British the first time. These are the created uh, states by the British. The British 
burned the Ottoman Navy lying on the port of Navarino. The British Admiral also caused the Russians to burn the Ottoman fleet in Sinop. You know, the British lead the, uh, these causes. And charge Russia and leave a need of Britain in defense of the sea. Creating a Greece serves the British interest. You know, uh, the meaning of the creating a Greece state, artificial Greece state. This is not the real Greeks, not the Hellens. Mahan says that if uh, the nations not close to maritime problems cannot do a strong navy. Admiral Franzo also said if the government and the parliament do not know about the maritime problems, the strength of the navy commander is not enough to win the war. The, this is the culture. Ottoman Empire and naval without the navy was the primary reason for the freedom of Greece the other nations. There was a navy, but navy hadn't might. Never in straight was also a stronger sign that this gave the strongest sign to the foreigners knew about the importance of the maritime policy. Uh, policy. Hellenic imperialism saw the agency as a great life field. The territory of the Greek kingdom was in, insufficient because small island, the poor island in the agency given to Greece and the rich islands on the border of Anatolia, the life of the uh, Turkey. If the Greece makes a strong geography by making strong navy, he can put it under the blockades of the island in the established and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the Turkey. On that time, especially in the maritime trade, to take the islands surrounding the Anatolia at the first opportunity and to put the Ottoman state back on the national blockade of its established uh, to Ottoman states, uh, do the strong navy, uh, at, if the Ottoman Empire is strong, uh, stable, if uh, Ottoman is weakness, uh, try to attack. You know, at this time, uh, Navy cannot do uh, 1897 uh, Ottoman war. Uh, the Navy uh, didn't smoke for years and whose machinery had rusted, were shattered in the island, inland sea de la Marmara, were left inactive in the middle of sea, you know. Uh, uh, Army do the best, but the navy is not. Abdulaziz, uh, you know, a strong naval forces gave the naval forces to Abdulhamid, but the Abdulhamid prevent the development of the land army. It uh, in the immobilized the corrupted the army navy in the same time. Abdulhamid is uh, after then. Uh, they uh, given the reinforced the navy, and for this purpose, uh, Mesudi and Asari Tevkir armored battles were repaired in Italy before 1903. The cruisers Samidi and Mesidi were bought, and drama was ordered to Italians, you know. But uh, <clears throat> Italian didn't give at that Italian Ottoman war, and uh, they uh, didn't give the, uh, the ship. They used the, under the name of Libya after then. Britain and, the, uh, and lead the British to research on the Ottoman Navy. Send a man, Admiral uh, Macker said that there is no talk. Uh, Turkish Navy is absent. There is no Navy. Greeks bought a new ship like our of. The Turkish Navy also owned two old ships, Barbaros Ayrettin and Turgut Reis, after that four destroyers were only one year old, were purchased from Germany. Yadigare Millet, Gayreti Vataniye, you know, these are the, but Turkish Navy in the Italian war was not 
capable of providing and sustaining all kinds of assistance that needed to be done in the Italian war. But you know, the Atatürk is, uh, have been the Italian war. Uh, Italian Navy was a superior Navy rather than the Italian land forces. This situation had its effect on the Balkan war and the Greek Navy had prevailed over the Turkish Navy during the period while the Greek Navy couldn't move freely in the Mediterranean. The Turkish Navy cannot do some things. Balkan War, one of the main reasons for the loss of both wars, absence of the Navy. We don't have the Navy, two wars. Uh, and the, the control of the sea. After purchasing uh, two ships, Yavuz and Medeli, uh, which participated in the uh, war first, one uh, world war, but uh, not provide complete naval dominance in the ships. The Turkish Navy was very worn out in the first war. The remaining naval forces entered by the allied forces after the first one war. The naval forces would only begin establish and develop over the time the Turkish Grand National Assembly, you know. Uh, I'm coming to conclusion. Although the Ottoman Empire was once the only great state of the Mediterranean in terms of maritime time, after he's defeated these uh, battles, some of defeated battles, uh, however, it is the only navy England in the Mediterranean, even in the 1860, the big mistake is the Turks left the seas to the Greeks. Very important. Oh, we left the uh, seas to the Greeks. The great nation highly conceives of its naval power and support of American Britain. They have always kept their naval forces superior to the Turkish Navy and they are trying to keep it. Towards Turkish lands, which Greece expansion's ambitions has shown two major failures. One of these, Anatolia, Turkish war independence, and the second prevention of annexation of Cyprus, Greece with the Cyprus uh, peace operation. Uh, The Greeks have always responded to humanitarian policy, followed by Turks since so dangerous policy. As a result, the Greek lands obtained the expansion of the uh, expense of the blood of hundreds of thousands Turkish myths and very short period, uh, 100 years separated from homelands. You know. Russian and French European stands behind them. We must save the Aegean from the Greek threat by making the Navy like the Barbaros era and making the Aegean a Turkish lake. Before, this, this was, you know, the, uh, like the Turkish lake in this Mediterranean. If we cannot do genocide, it uh, will appear as a systemic genocide in Anatolia before. Uh, as a result, I'm saying that uh, Greek is a very big threat to the Mediterranean to us. Uh, we are the, I'm the uh, army officer, but we must do the Navy, the best in the world, like the Barbaros time. So we must do the important things for the reality about the Greece, because Greece is a small country, but behind the Americans, other uh, nations, Europe, France, uh, these are, we must look at these options. Thank you very much. You are listening to me and then they giving me the, this opportunity. I'm respecting to uh, dear Admiral uh, Metin Atash and the Oral and the Funda Sungur. Greetings to you and the other audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Deniz Denizdi for giving us a historical perspective on Turkish Navy. Uh, our next speaker is 
Professor Dr. Ulvi Keser. Uh, Professor Keser is joining us from Vienna American University. And his presentation is on intelligence activities and the struggle in the Mediterranean Sea during the First World War. Yes, Professor Keser, the floor is yours, sir. Professor Keser, can you hear me? No, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Please. I just Please want try. to show and present my appreciation and uh, thankful feelings since we have a very chaotic atmosphere uh, more than one year. Actually, we have uh, missed our citizens. We have missed the scientific uh, opportunities face to face, but no problem. Uh, it's a scientific uh, study and we are face to face using the uh, technology. All right, I am I'm, uh, to talk about the intelligence activities, uh, especially during the World War the first, but some will reflect to day. Uh, so uh, the past will be a bridge to show us what is going to be in future. Uh, actually, we have so far, I myself, for instance, have studied almost every point of Cyprus. But what I see is that we have uh, ignored or omitted uh, something behind the curtain uh, so far, nobody, nobody talked about the intelligence activities, especially uh, generally in the Eastern Mediterranean activities in the area. At first, uh, I have to prepare this uh, research. I have studied in the British, in the French, in the US, and then uh, TRNC, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, then in Turkey, Turkish presidential, and once, once upon a time, I mean in Turkish prime ministry, uh, then general staff uh, archive, and some uh, private archives abroad. So uh, this is going to be a summary of the archive studies from different uh, countries. Now, uh, you know, uh, starting from the Egyptians, uh, the area, I mean, the Mediterranean is named to be uh, Mare Nostrum, our sea. Uh, so almost all the countries, almost all the people, almost all the communities have uh, pretended to capture, pretended to uh, invade, pretended to conquer the area. So out of the out of the weapons, out of the ordinary wars, uh, especially in the Mediterranean, what we see, or sometimes what we are unable to see is the psychological warfare. And it is carried out by the intelligence and the psychological warfare perceptions. Uh, so I am to give you some uh, remarkable points upon it. Uh, what we see, starting from 1914, what we see in the area is a very, very specific uh, department named AMSIP, Eastern Mediterranean Special Intelligence Bureau. This is really very important for our history. Unfortunately, nobody except me has so far studied upon it. Uh, the British authorities, just to disturb just to disturb, as the French authorities do, uh, just to disturb the Ottoman, have established a very specific intelligence department named AMSIP, Eastern Mediterranean uh, Special Intelligence Bureau. It's very interesting. And interestingly, the director or the commander, I don't, I don't, I don't restrain to say commander, because the, the position is a little bit uh, sophisticated uh, since it is a military unit, uh, but the director himself is a civilian person. And the, uh, Sir uh, Charles Leonard, 
Charles Leonard Woolley, an archaeologist, an archaeologist named Charles Leonard Woolley, is the director, is the commander, is whatever it is, uh, the head of this very huge, limitless uh, intelligence bureau. Because ranging from ranging from the Eastern Mediterranean towards the Balkans, the Black Sea, the uh, Eurasia area, as we named the uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and uh, the area uh, there, and then the Middle East and North African territories, uh, they have to right to get uh, information and intelligence uh, with the collaboration of France and Italy. It's really very interesting uh, reflecting the past or reflecting yesterday, today and tomorrow. Uh, we have some really very original uh, examples how to read the history because in 1914, what we see in the Mediterranean is the French uh, aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers uh, not only to carry the French aircraft, but to bomb the Ottoman seasides. For instance, Iskenderun has been bombed six times by the French aircraft, aircraft as you know, but the French aircraft carriers have been mostly used for the intelligence services within the structure of uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, Special Intelligence Bureau or department. And interestingly, interestingly, and as you know, today, even today, uh, French has a, a aircraft carrier named Chastego and uh, to uh, about, about, about 11 months of the year, uh, the, the aircraft carrier today uh, spends the time uh, of Cyprus, as you know, just one man uh, sailing towards Toulouse uh, to have some restoration or re reconnaissance. Anyway, uh, and there in 1914, starting from 1914, what we see is a hotel, very interesting, uh, in Masa, or as we call Gazi Masa, or in English, Amagusta, a hotel named Savoy is the intelligence headquarter for the French, British, and Italian forces. And very interesting and amazing position is that the same hotel is also located in Egypt, in Cairo and Alexandria. So three hotels with the same name have been functioned as the intelligent, intelligence headquarter for these multinational uh, intelligence uh, system, Savoy Hotel. And uh, even during the World War II, we see this Savoy Hotel again as the intelligence uh, headquarter in the same area. Out of, out of the British, French and Italian forces, what we see there is Teshkilat Masa or uh, Ottoman intelligence services. How they work there is very interesting because uh, during the history of the Ottoman Empire, what we see is that Ford Aviation Company, Ford Aviation Company uh, is uh, established in Istanbul and all of a sudden carried to uh, Mediterranean area, first located at Pozante Gulek and then Tashuju. Why? Just to have intelligence, just to have uh, intelligence uh, photographies, just to have some information uh, about what is happening uh, generally in the Eastern Mediterranean, specifically uh, on the island, I mean in Cyprus. And there we have a very interesting military personnel named Mita Tunjel or Lieutenant Mita Tunjel. Uh, despite the fact that he's an uh, engineering officer in the Ottoman Empire, he is the first pilot. He's the first pilot of the Ottoman Empire. In our history, as you know, uh, 
we see uh, Risa has the has the has the has the first batch number one, but the first pilot of the Ottoman Empire is Mita Tunjelbay. It's really very interesting, and he has two uh, files. Uh, so he is the second to none person, very unique person because uh, you know any official or any military personnel uh, working for his country has only one file, a personal file. But Mita Tunjel, Lieutenant Mita Tunjel has two files: one as a uh, military pilot, two as a military engineering. It's very interesting, and his batch number is. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think 11 or 12. So uh, Ford Aviation Company starts working, uh, first located, as I said, in Tash uh, Pozante, and then carried to uh, Tashuju since it's more uh, closer to Cyprus, as you know. Uh, but because it's really very difficult uh, to commute, to go or to fly, uh, over the Mediterranean to take some photos or information and then turn back to Pozante. Uh, so they have changed the position. And then two years later in 1916 or at the end of 1916, uh, we see the first uh, maritime uh, Air Force company of the Ottoman Empire still working in the Mediterranean. Uh, to get information. So uh, it's really very interesting. And then uh, specifically focusing on Cyprus, even if the island itself seems to be out of the war, but uh, the, the island itself is the very center of the war. Why? As I said a few minutes before, we see MC headquarter in Cyprus. Out of this headquarter, what we see there is 10 different intelligence headquarters established in Cyprus. Once more, 10 intelligence headquarters. And then, and then 48, 48 different intelligence and espionage stations located and established all over the island. And forgetting the past, today, Today, today uh, the ref we see the reflections because out of two British sovereign bases in Cyprus, what we see is that unfortunately nobody talks about it uh, or almost nobody knows nothing about it. Out of those two British bases, what we see today is 254 intelligence stations uh, in the service of British, American, Israeli and their uh, allies on the island even today. All right, out of all these intelligence and espionage uh, facilities, what we see on the island is that number one, starting from 1915, uh, Carolos prisoner of war camp, uh, as you know, the Chanakale uh, prisoner of wars uh, captured by the British were firstly uh, transferred to the uh, CO Isles, unfortunately, what we see, what we say today, uh, to the uh, CO Isles, and for one year, for one year, the, the prisoner of wars were captured in the Isle of Sea. And then in 1916, all those Chanakkale prisoners of war were taken, transferred to Cyprus. Totally uh, 6,732 prisoner of war, Turkish prisoner of war from Çanakkale uh, front. And uh, starting from 13th of October, 1916, up to 13th March, 1920, uh, 6,732 uh, Turkish prisoners of war were captured or were kept in Cyprus. Out of this prisoner of war camp, what we see on the island is that uh, another one, French Legion Dorian camp. As you know, as you know, as you know, uh, after 13th October 1918, uh, the French 
the French forces have invaded or marched in Chukurova, or as once said, uh, Kilikia area. So we say in our history, uh, Urfa turned to be Shanlurfa, Gaziantep, uh, to be uh, Antep, to be Gaziantep, and then Marash to uh, Karama, Marash, blah, blah, blah. But there, what we see in the area, I mean, in Kilikia or Chukurova, what we see is the French uniformed Armenians. All those personnel, all those military personnel in Kilikia area are, with no exception, are Armenians. Armenians, French uniformed Armenians, uh, fighting, working, butchering, killing Turkish innocent people under the French flag. And unfortunately, all those were uh, collected from different uh, countries, firstly collected, gathered, and assembled in Egypt, then uh, transferred to Cyprus and trained there. So uh, starting from 1915 up to our Ankara Treaty, as you know, uh, we see the camp, we see the French uh, Armenian uh, Legion Dorian camp, in Cyprus, so uh, the intelligence intelligence challenge over Mediterranean and Cyprus is really very bloody, very severe, very remarkable for our history. Uh, it seems to be uh, behind the curtain or behind the closed doors, but uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Special Intelligence Bureau against Teshkilat Ottoman Intelligence Service are uh, really, 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 really uh, having a, a bloody fighting there. And uh, they themselves, I mean, the Ottoman Intelligence Service and the personnel working for them is uh, sacrificing, sacrificing themselves. So, all right, let's put a side. Then we see uh, in Mausa, in Famagusta, another intelligence headquarter named Karolos. Karolos, we, we, we name it today Karakol. Uh, there now, uh, what we locate or what we establish is our Gusaram military uh, training camp uh, to over the Turkish Republic or Northern Cyprus. And then, and then because the British force authorities uh, want to have uh, military personnel from Cyprus, they have had a depot or a training camp for the muleteers. Muleteers is a special uh, military unit working for the British uh, in World War I and World War II. They, they are not the original uh, British subjects, but some people like Turkish Cypriots, Greek Cypriots, Indian, Pakistani, or something, and they are shortly named uh, militiers because especially the uh, Turkish Cypriots uh, have a great ability to train the mules, as you know, especially when the British uh, military units have difficulties to use or to drive their trucks in the rough areas. So, they need the Turkish Cypriots as well as the Greek Cypriots to have their mules there. So uh, about uh, 11,220 uh, Cypriot people were enlisted on the island. And out of this number, what we see is about roughly 1,100 Turkish Cypriots are enlisted. Uh, within the British uniforms. And then, and then... Professor, uh, Professor, we... Professor, I'm sorry to interrupt. You have yeah. three minutes left. Yeah, all right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And then, and then, and then, uh, shortly, let's have a summary. Uh, these intelligence bureaus and activities uh, are on progress even today. In 1939, we see the same hotels as the headquarters for the espionage and intelligence activities. And after the war uh, in 19, 
47, we see a treaty between the US and United Kingdom named UKUSA, United Kingdom, USA, to control and to watch and to go on all the world. And today, what we see uh, on the island, what we see in the Mediterranean area, and what we see in the world is uh, a bigger system named Echelon. And the very center of all these systems are, as you know, uh, located in Cyprus as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kesef, for giving us uh, informative speech on intelligence activities in the Mediterranean Sea in a historical perspective. Thank you very much. In the next part, actually, this is the last part of the first session. Uh, our speaker is Associated Professor Dr. Ergun Demirel. Uh, Dr. Demirel is joining us from the host university, Eurus University. And his, and his topic is Turkish presence in the Mediterranean and maritime strategy. Yes, Dr. Demir, the floor is yours, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your attention. And I would like to share my biograph. Okay. I think it is now uh, you can see my biographs. Okay. No, no, no we can't. No, you can't. Sorry. Uh, okay. Can you share screen at the bottom of the screen? Yes. Okay. Is, is that okay? It's coming. It's coming. Yes. Now we can see your screen. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, purposely, I have used Turkish presence presence in the Mediterranean and the maritime strategy because we are talking about the Ottomans. But the Turks were in the Mediterranean before the Ottomans and after the Ottomans. Okay, a short story of the uh, Mediterranean. And uh, it shows the development of the shipping in the world. And everything is started in the Mediterranean. The trade routes of the products on the and the Mediterranean trade cities were first first determined by the Phoenicians, a maritime nation, and brought into the systematic state. The control of these routes was later provided by the Carthaginians, who were the successors of the Phoenicians. The people who started the maritime trade in the Mediterranean in the early ages were the Phoenicians since 2000, 3000 before the Christ, and the later Egyptians started maritime trade between Egypt, Anatolia, and the Lebanon. Since uh, 300 before the Christ, uh, Christ, the Hellens established commercial centers in the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean and started to trade between them by sea. Venice was the most important state in the Mediterranean and the Spain, especially after 1453, when there was no chance for conducting activity in the Eastern Mediterranean, they tried to find a place in the Atlantic and turned to the discovery of New World. Turks came to the Mediterranean in the Eastern Mediterranean from 1490 onwards and between the years of the 15,000 and the 16,000, they dominated the entire Mediterranean. From the beginning of the six, uh, 1600s, the British also came to the Mediterranean and started to control critical points such as Gibraltar, Cyprus in the historical process. Although France made a voyage to Egypt during the Napoleonic period. It later headed towards the Northwest African coast. Although the Italians captured Libya in 1912, uh, they could not permanent here. After the World War II, the United States became the spare power in the Mediterranean, although the Soviets established naval bases in Egypt and Syria against the United States. 
they lost these bases in a short period. In this study, in the studies on the Mediterranean basin, Turks or Ottoman maritime relations have not been examined independently outside the general strategy of the state. It is not a correct approach to expect an empire trying to spread its domination area, both to Europe and Asia and Africa, to use its naval power outside of these general political goals. At the end of the 11th century, the Turks reached Anatolia and have begun to penetrate the Mediterranean basin, starting from Aegean Sea. Depending on the enhancing territories, the maritime power began to spread towards the Western and Eastern Mediterranean. As Ottoman Navy has operated in the coastal waters of the Aegean and the Ionian Sea until 15th century, then it became a dominant sea power in almost all Mediterranean basin after the 16th century. This, this superiority enabled the Ottoman Empire to apply a strategy to enhance the sovereignty areas in all three continents. Following Ottoman conquest uh, Egypt in 1517, Ottoman Navy has expanded its activities in the Indian Oceans and conduct maritime operations in the west of the Indian Peninsula and the East African coast. Until the beginning of the 19th century, the Ottomans continued dominance in the Western Mediterranean theater and operations started to withdraw the Eastern Mediterranean gradually as a result of mergers of new political forces in the Mediterranean. This study examines how the Turkish maritime power has been deployed within the overall strategy of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, now I will directly pass to the conclusion because of the time constraint. Okay, during the establishment and expansion period after taking the control of small principalities in Anatolia, the Ottoman understood the need for a naval power to support their strategy as they planned to expand into the Balkans consisting of small and quarreling feudal principalities. For this purpose, they start to capture political po critical ports and islands in the Northern Aegean and organize the expeditions through West. In the conquest of uh, Istanbul, the Navy was used to support the uh, Saish and it was strictly prevented from Venice and the Genovese to support Byzantium by sea. After the seizure of both sides of the Bosphor, a full size, uh, a full sea dominance was achieved in the Black Sea. And the powerful maritime countries of the time, Venice and Genovese, were completely prevented from entering the Black Sea. As a result of the Ottomans shifting the domination areas to the Balkans, the Middle East and the Caucasus, they began to control the Silk Road connecting Europe and the, to Asia and establishing sea control in the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. Which is alternative to this route indicates that the Ottomans received a harmony between their land and sea strategies in the beginning period. That shows that they evaluate the naval power very well within the general strategy of the state. After taking the trade routes in the Mediterranean under control, the new strategy of the Ottoman state was established a healthy economic system to support the future expansion policies. For this purpose, Ottoman uh, gave importance to trade and therefore to sea trade. The purpose of the Ottoman naval operation carried out in this period was not for Gazawat or Jihad, but to control the maritime trade routes in order to sustain a strong economy. Conqueror Sultan Mehmet, Mehmet II, was not satisfied with this. And by establishing a large shipyard in Istanbul, he improved the quality and the quantity of the Navy. This effort has also been supported by foreign policy moves. The conqueror gave capitulations, privileges to the British and tried to form an alliance 
against uh, Venice and Genovese. As a result, the powerful seafaring countries of that time, Venice and Genovese, prevented them uh, from entering the agency. This naval strategy initiated by the Mehmet II was fully implemented during the reign uh, of uh, Yavuz Sultan Selim and uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. And Turks became the dominant nation, first in the East and then in the Western Mediterranean. The Turks understood that critical port and critical passages had to be captured to maintain sea control. For this purpose, they have implemented the land-sea joint amphibious operation, which is difficult to realize even today. In 1462, Limni Island was, or Lemnos Island was captured by an amphibious operation. Later, Rhodos, Crete, Cyprus, and Gerba Islands were passed through Taranto amphibious operations and all critical passages of the Eastern Mediterranean were taken under the Ottoman control. Western claims that even though the Ottomans gained sea dominance in the Mediterranean, they could not benefit much from the sea trade. They gave the Westerns some concessions, gave the sea trade under their control, and that they were not instead in exports and that they established a commercial system based on import. However, when the economy of the 15th and the 16th centuries is considered, they overlook that the Ottomans controlled a large land area and trade routes between uh, Europe and Asia and kept the state alive with the fees, charges, and the taxes coming from these regions. The Ottomans obtain, uh, ob obtained the equivalent and even more of the revenues that the Westerns obtained from the sea trade with fees and charges. Another claim is that Ottomans did not conduct real serious operations in the Mediterranean, but carried out piracy and carried out hit and run operations. There are no permanent sea fleets of other Mediterranean countries in the between the 19th and the 17th centuries, and the people we call pirates are gathered under the name of naval fleet in case of need. The pirates serving the Ottoman Empire did not act independently as tow, but under the auspice of a certain state and provide taxes and duties to that state, something like Costco. However, we can say that despite the existence of many naval forces, and most of the time they were gathered under the alliance, the Mediterranean Sea was controlled by the Turkish Navy and it is pirates to a large extent between 1590 and I say 1800. This shows the Ottoman bases in the Mediterranean after 1574. Okay, uh, Ottomans applied three forms of control of sea lines of communications. These are command at sea, sea control, and the sea denial operations. Depending upon the force composition or cooperation between them and other naval forces in the Mediterranean, depending upon your uh, situation and the condition of the your enemies, you can apply one of them. And the command at, uh, at sea, it is the hardest one, and you should control all the ports and all sea lines of communications. The second one is the sea control. Sea control is a definite, for a definite time and definite area. A sea denial seeks to deny the enemy effective use of the sea. And it is evident Ottoman used uh, both uh, all these forms of naval operations depending upon the political and economic conditions. And uh, uh, I said uh, uh, before 1800, this treaty, this treaty 
Barbary Treaties between 1786 and 1816. And all these coasts were under the control of Ottomans. And the United States, when they come to the Mediterranean, they make a uh, treaty with the Turks. That shows that still at, at the end of the at the end of the 19, uh, 18th century, still the Ottomans were active in the Western Mediterranean. The dominance of the Ottoman naval power in the Mediterranean was completely lost after the Navarino battle in 1827. The Ottoman fleet consisted of wooden ships and could not adopt itself. Modern technology largely destroyed in the Navarino and could not recover after this date. Okay, finally, <clears throat> there is a saying attributed to the German professor Fritz Neumar. If you remove the Turk from history, there will be no history. However, unfortunately, Turks could not take an active role in the writing of the world's history. It is also clear that those who write history generally look at events from their own windows. Our own researchers, academics, who study our history based on foreign sources, rely heavily on these biased sources. For this reason, there were even those who made evaluations that mean Turks have never been a maritime nation. There is no Turkish maritime history. It is time to write our own maritime history by making use of the state archives. archives. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Demirel, for your presentation, the condensed and detailed presentation of the Mediterranean strategy. Uh, yes, with Dr. Demirel's presentation, we have completed the first session presentations of the morning session. I would like to all, I would like to thank all three speakers for their valuable contributions. And before we go for lunch break, the next 30 minutes is allocated for question and answer period. Dear guests, please feel free to ask your questions. But before we proceed, I would like to remind you the process. In order to avoid any confusion and mix up, and also to make best use of time, you are kindly requested to ask your questions in written format using the chat box located at the bottom of your screens. Please indicate your identity, to whom you're asking the question, and the question itself. The technical manager will direct the questions with the order he receives them, so that we will be able to ask the participants the questions. And of course, uh, I would again like to remind you that considering the time uh, constraints and the uh, theme of the symposium, please narrow your questions down to the speakers uh, who have presented in the first session. Yes, we are now waiting for your questions to direct them to the speakers. I guess Professor Dejanario has a question. Uh, I I was yes, please please go ahead. I was I was writing my questions, so I uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, yeah? we can hear you. Ma yes, please yes, yeah. Well, I I have to, uh, a certain number of things to challenge. Um, regarding the, the, the presentation of uh, uh, Professor de Mirel, uh, well, the first of all, the, these last sections that uh, Turks do not take 
active role in the writing of world history. It's not true. It's any more true. Perhaps it was true, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 years ago or even 15 years ago. But actually, uh, all the scholars that are working in uh, world uh, history, and I would like to have the opinion of uh, uh, Dr. Simantep on, 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 on this, or sorry, Dr. Demiral on this, uh, all the narratives of world history, which we should not uh, confuse with uh, global history or comparative history, because it's not at all the same thing. Uh, in world history, actually, there's a uh, uh, a given role to the to the Turkish history, uh, which is absolutely outstanding. None of the actual world histories that are published worldwide ignores anymore uh, the history of um, the Ottoman Empire, even in its um, let's say maritime di dimension. So I think this is important. And this is, is a, a question of uh, uh, Dr. De Mirel, uh, because I don't know upon what archives is relying when he says that the revenues uh, that the Westerners obtained from the sea trade in the Mediterranean uh, were inferior to those of the Ottomans. I think we can it depends on the period, of course. Uh, but if you are talking about the early modern period, let's say the 16, 16, 15, end of 15th and 16th century, uh, I think this, this is a uh, controversial assertion uh, because we have data from the, um, let's say, commerce of the Republic, especially from Genoa and Venice, uh, regarding uh, devices or commodities like sugar or uh, like uh, spices, and it's not at all the same uh, figures. So uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Bülent Aru, uh, which is a specialist in economic history, and is among us, he could add something about that. And then uh, I think the question of the independence of pirates and privateers from the state, it's a, a challenging question, which is very much discussion. So perhaps we should not uh, be very conclusive on this idea uh, that these privateers and pirates were really too much uh, linked to the central uh, government, I mean, to, in the empire. Uh, because what comes out in the last historiography and the last works is that the way of functioning, it's very much close to other empires, like, for example, the Spanish of the Portuguese empires in the Americas or in the, on the Asia is that the Ottoman government, central government, was uh, using the services of these privateers uh, when, it, when needed, but the relationships could be sometimes quite loose. So the question of this linkage, uh, it's still a very commercial uh, issue using either Western or Ottoman archives, you know, providing information from other and different archives. So these are my uh, comments and my questions, but perhaps uh, there are many others. And I would like uh, Professor uh, Ari uh, to say something about the question of commerce, because I think he's more entitled than me uh, to talk in terms of economic history. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> let me uh, answer this question in a different manner. Because the Ottomans was controlling uh, the, the trade between Europe and Asia, and uh, the Silk Road was under the control of the Turks, and uh, uh, it was a big, 
it, uh, the Turkish or Ottoman or Turkish controlled ports were very important and uh, they have made uh, a lot of money uh, using the ports and controlling the uh, trade routes. It sounds like today the position of Russian Federation, as you know, for the petroleum, the oil, the Russia is actually, except some uh, specific places, is not the oil producer. The, let's say Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan produce the oil and uh, the Russian control the pipelines, a kind of uh, trade route, and they make big money, although they are not the producer. And uh, actually, if we look at the, the uh, 15th or the 16th century, it was important to gain money controlling the routes, the trade routes, and controlling the critical ports. And uh, this, uh, let me share by, uh, uh, as you see, this view graph shows the ports and the areas under the control of the Ottomans. And uh, this was a big uh, opportunity for the economy. And uh, uh, without, uh, or let's say, uh, you cannot trespassing the Ottomans to obtain uh, the trade between the West and the East. And uh, the Turks made uh, a lot of money from these sources. And uh, uh, this shows the Ottoman budget. Ottoman budget in the 19th century. And as you see, uh, for a long period, uh, it starts to slow down. But uh, even though by uh, 1748, uh, there is a, a, a increase, uh, but after the 16th or 17th century, there is a drop in the uh, income. But there is a, a increase in the uh, expenditures. And uh, let's say uh, most of the money uh, gained from the control of the trade routes and the ports. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer and your contribution. Uh, we have one more question, but before proceeding with the question, I would like to ask uh, Professor Ara if he has anything to say, because uh, Professor Tuto addressed him. Professor Ali, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Professor Kutu. Uh, we should mention first the uh, critical historical uh, timelines in the uh, economic expansion of Ottoman history. So these are uh, mostly coincided with the uh, 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 armament and naval development of Ottoman history and geographical expansion of the Ottoman history, uh, Ottoman army. So uh, there are some uh, critical timelines in the uh, Ottoman state. One of them, the first one is the uh, conquest of Istanbul. The fall of Constantinople has changed many things in uh, the history of the Mediterranean. So there are two rivals in, uh, in this period after uh, 1453, Venice and Ottomans. Uh, so Genoese were also not the rivals, but the, uh, uh, one of the ally of the Ottoman Empire. Then uh, uh, Ottomans and Venetians had become uh, rivals. So it led to uh, a long lasting uh, uh, battles uh, between Venice and Ottomans from 1463 uh, until uh, 1479. So 16 years of naval battles. Uh, so Ottomans had dominated. Uh, afterwards, uh, uh, there are some uh, not naval, but uh, territorial uh, conquests of the Ottomans. So another point has came uh, with the fall of uh, Rhodes in 1522, uh, which resulted in the end with the uh, uh, Holy Navy. Uh, in 15, 
38 uh, in the Mediterranean, in Preveze. Preveze is the, uh, the most important turning point in Mediterranean history mm. and also economic history. So yeah. Ottomans, Ottomans are dominant uh, in naval power, uh, but also uh, they have economic alliance with, uh, with the West. So these are mostly uh, Italian city-states. Yes. Uh, but Spain and Portugal were the enemies, so they were not in the Mediterranean, but especially in the Levant, uh, so in the east of Malta. So we can divide uh, in the Mediterranean into two, the west of Malta and east of Malta. Of Malta. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, yes. So in the 17th century, it was the, uh, mm. the main point, main border was Gibraltar. Uh, it was Atlantic now. Uh, but in the uh, mid uh, 16th century, which uh, our presenters had given valuable information to us, it was uh, uh, a, actually an economic uh, conflict, uh, but resulted with naval, uh, naval con uh, conflicts. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, uh, this uh, time zone, it was. Uh, almost ended uh, with uh, Lepanto War in 1571. After 1571, uh, there is an, uh, a very interesting episode in the Mediterranean. Now it was uh, alliances with the Protestant powers. Uh, these allies were Britain, uh, England at that time, England and the Dutch, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Spain and Portugal. So when Portugal disappeared uh, until 1640, so the Ottomans has closed uh, not uh, naval alliances, not uh, uh, military alliances, but uh, commercial alliances. Uh, this is very important uh, regarding your question. Uh, after Lepanto, a new episode starts. It, it, alliances are economic alliances after that. So we have to uh, conclude the alliances in economic point of view. So instead of military alliances, Ottomans has uh, called these two Protestant powers, England and uh, the Dutch. Uh, so this is very important uh, until uh, uh, they have uh, established a network of uh, consulates in the Mediterranean. Uh, but we can follow that Mediterranean is no more uh, of major importance, but it falls into the secondary importance uh, with ne uh, newly established colonial zones in uh, Southern Americas uh, and Indias and Far East. Uh, so uh, we have to conceptualize all these naval and military developments uh, in parallel with these economic developments. Uh, as mentioned just before about the pipelines of Russia, uh, the Ottomans has, the, has control or all the uh, uh, commercial lines like Silk Road uh, and uh, uh, Spice Road. Uh, with the entrance of these uh, two states, Britain and uh, English and uh, the Dutch, uh, these uh, pipelines of the Ottomans, uh, huge revenues, uh, were shifted uh, to the Atlantic uh, and new trade roads. Uh, this is the fall of naval power of both Ottomans uh, and revenues of the Ottomans. So, so these pipelines had stopped. Uh, nice, so, uh, after, afterwards, this is, uh, so we, we enter a new episode after uh, mid 17th century. These can be followed from the uh, notary and commercial uh, loads uh, of the Venetian, French, Dutch, and English ship loads uh, uh, from Aleppo, uh, from Alexandria, uh, from Alexandria to Istanbul, and newly uh, established uh, export, uh, export center in Simirna, today's Izmir. Thank you, Professor, for your... Okay, not, not to make it so long, maybe you can conceptualize in a general way. If, if you have anything more to say, yes, we can hear that, no problem. 
we yeah, well, I, I would like only just to add one thing is that the studies of Nelly Anna uh, are quite helpful for the economy, for the revenues of Egypt, at least for the 16th, uh, 16th 17th century. century. Yeah. Okay. But we can mention that uh, the Mediterranean is uh, after mid 17th century, it is of secondary importance, but it has yes, not yes. collapsed. But it has not collapsed totally. It has not collapsed. Yeah, yes, yes, I agree with you, of course. Yeah, there are some rumors that it has collapsed. Yeah. Actually, it has not collapsed because uh, the Straits, uh, East Constantinople, Istanbul, and Smyrna is mm -hmm. now uh, two uh, important export centers. So these cities are important, these ports are important for the Black Sea trade. Yes. The commercial activity from Black Sea. Uh, Russia, Crimea, and to yes, Istanbul, yes, yes, yes. I, and I, for I, whole Anatolia, they established uh, a new uh, new port. It is Smyrna. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. Smyrna has risen the instead of, of the Aleppo. Rise of Smyrna. Yeah. Yeah. There are many uh, many publications before, as you can yeah. imagine, mm -hmm. uh, about Smyrna, Aleppo, and uh, uh, Alexandria. Uh, but we need uh, for uh, concrete information, we need more data about the uh, shiploads. So these... Uh, shipping. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, shipping and the uh, yeah, port, shipping. port uh, I mean, port registers. So we have yes. limited number of port registers. Yes. Uh, these port registers are available from London, from Amsterdam, uh, from Rotterdam, mm -hmm. uh, Portugal, Lisbon. We have in the West, but we have limited number of port registers from Aleppo, Alexandria, from Smyrna. Yes. These are limited. Uh, there should be new, uh, maybe PhD studies regarding the uh, yes, yes, yes. port registers. Of this can give us uh, general information, and these kinds yes. of diggings give us a general opinion about uh, uh, economic history, because yes. most of them are not uh, are not true, as you can imagine. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think one of the problems of the Middle East, when you think on the early period, is that we don't have many registers, as you said, from the shipping of these ports, even for the inner trade on the empire. Uh, for example, we have from Aleppo, uh, but for example, from Tripoli of Syria, uh, even from Alexandria, I think there's still many work to be done and, and digging on the archives uh, to, to, to find more evidence uh, to have at least more reliable statistics on this uh, economic uh, sea uh, trade. Even Cyprus, the island of Cyprus was very important. Uh, yes. Cyprus is a minor island in uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but uh, we, can, we can imagine that uh, in the late 15th and 16th centuries, even 17th centuries, mm -hmm. uh, Cyprus was very important. Uh, it was, we can imagine, maybe we can guess that it was a kind of uh, Hong Kong of the Mediterranean uh, in the 17th yeah. and uh, even 18th sort of century. Yes. Uh, and Dubrovnik, we have we have very little connection uh, with the Ottoman dominions and Dubrovnik. Uh, another uh, Hong Kong style uh, structure was in Dubrovnik at that time, mm. uh, because it is a kind of uh, a neutral area. Uh, Ottomans did not control everywhere. Uh, well, so the same with Ragusa. The same with Ragusa. Yeah, Ragusa. Yeah, Ragusa was play. also. An, they pay tribute to the Ottomans, but they were quite autonomous. Uh, uh, it was a little, a little tribute, not a huge amount. Yes, no, but anyway, they were quite important. I think we must keep them in mind. Right. But they were an open area, public uh, customs free zone. Yes, so that's it was what a I kind of for the Adriatic. It was a customs free zone, yes. uh, not only for the Venetians, but also for Western uh, yes. exports and imports. Every, everybody, yes. So this uh, connections has not made uh, very uh, relying on very concrete data. Mm. Very limited research are made in Rakuza. Maybe next time our uh, mm -hmm. uh, president uh, Metin Pasha can uh, arrange a meeting in uh, Rakuza.
rather than Malta, we need to yes. make more uh, digging well, in Rakuza and Archives. Also, because in uh, Rakuza and in, in Drobovnik, we have more archives. Yeah. I mean, we have important... And both Italian documents and Ottoman documents so, are available. So it's yes. uh, a treasury in for future research. Dear professors, thank you very much for your contributions. We have some other questions and we are running out of time. If you could just let me, I, I will proceed with the other questions. If that, if, if that is okay with you. I will ask a question. Just a moment. Uh, yes. I have two questions here. Yes. Uh, from Professor Denizli to both Dr. Demirel and Professor Keser. Dr. Demirel, I would kindly of request you to wrap it up in just two minutes because we are running out of time. The question I'm quoting from uh, Professor Denizli reads as, he thanks you for the presentation and his question is, why did we not get lessons from history and gave the AG into hands of Greece? That is the question asked by uh, Professor Denizli, please wrap it up in two minutes because we are short of time. Yes, Dr. Demre. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, show something because uh, I would like to share uh, uh, something on the Corsair and the pirate words. In the Western sources, generally, Turks uh, mariners are called as pirates. But uh, as you know, there are two words in the literature. One of them is the uh, Corsairs, and the other one is the Pirates. In the Ottoman Empire time, uh, they were making cursor operations. And cursor operations, I'm originally a naval officer, I know that still we have cursor operations in the maritime side. And the cursor, uh, cursor operations means to search and find operations against enemy or any target at the sea. And uh, the uh, units or the people who conduct the cursor operations are called cursors, uh, called corsairs. And it doesn't mean the pirate, the thieves, the bandits, and the sea bandits. And uh, it is uh, evident that uh, the uh, people who called the barbarian corsairs or Ottoman corsairs are actually acting like a Coast Guard uh, fleet. And uh, today, even though today, all Coast Guard operations is mainly based on the cursor, cursor operations. And uh, when they write the history, they say, for example, Admiral Andre Doria, but pirate Barbarus Hayrettin. It is something wrong. And uh, uh, firstly, we should realize the meaning of the Corsair and the meaning of the uh, pirates. And uh, I think after that, we shouldn't call them as Corsairs. They were acting as Coast Guard units of the uh, fleet of the Ottoman Empire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benre. The second question from... Uh, Professor Dennis is directed to Professor Kesser. Again, I'm quoting him. He thanks you for the presentation and he, tell, he asks you, I, I guess in the sense of intelligence activities, he says, uh, is British, has British captured Cyprus, is control of sea, is, that means it is in the hands of British. That is what it reads as, okay. Do you have an answer to that, Professor? Yes, sir. Professor Kessler, can you hear me? It is unmoved. Yeah. Professor Kessler, we cannot hear you. Please unmute your microphone. Yeah, I hear I hear all you, but I couldn't understand the question. Would you please okay. give me the the exact yes, words I, I are just... like this. This is this is the exact words. Okay. Is yeah. British captured Cyprus? Is control of sea is on the hands of British? I guess he is asking from uh, intelligence point of view. 
<laughs> I, I see what I couldn't understand. What is the question here? Because I can't understand the English here. Okay. You, you, you know. Let, let me give the floor to uh, Professor Dennis Diff for his question. Yeah. But yeah. Sure thank you. Let me remind you that we have yeah, thank you. two minutes more. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Hey. Yes, Professor Dennis, if you want to paraphrase this question to uh, Professor Kesser, please go ahead and do so. Please unmute first. No voice. No voice. Mm -hmm. No voice Sorry. from Mr. Ali Denizdi. We cannot hear you. You should. You should switch your. Uh, yes. Microphone. Yes. I'm asking yes. you. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice to meet you, uh, Professor Lukasar. Uh, do you hear me? And then yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank yeah. you, the uh, Commander uh, Ergun Demirel. I'm asking you that uh, British captured the Cyprus, you know, uh, 1878 captured the Cyprus. Mm -hmm. I have the bases and they're controlling yeah. the Mediterranean Aegean. And then uh -huh. the, what is the importance of this capturing? You know, the capturing the Cyprus and the controlling the sea, the Ottoman power at that time. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you, a good question. Actually, just before starting to have my presentation, I should have told about it, but because we have the time limitation, so I couldn't. Uh, you know, 1878 uh, is of very importance for our history because we say, or unfortunately, our history books show that uh, the British authorities have rented Cyprus, blah, blah, something completely wrong. Here, what we see is a strategic step taken by the British and still on progress. Why? Because, as you know, in 1878, we see a 1903 war, as we, as we say so, you know, uh, Ottoman-Russia uh, war, unfortunately, lost once more. Uh, so, uh, the British the British authorities have finally regarded that to defend, to protect, to help, uh, to give some uh, financial or logistic uh, assistance to Ottoman is in vain. So they have given up all. Then in 1878, they have taken their strategical security uh, wall from the Black Sea, down to the Mediterranean. Imagine in your mind a line, a security line, starting from the Balkans, passing through the Black Sea, coming towards the Eurasia. The, the Britain, the Britain uh, military mind has taken the line, has taken the strategic security line down to the Mediterranean, starting from the Middle East, passing through the Mediterranean, and going out uh, Gibraltar and then to the ocean, as you know. Here the question is this, doing so, doing so, who is to, or how is to protect the area up? I mean, the Balkans, the Black Sea and the Eurasia. You know, you know the Balkans were, uh, was given, was offered to Greece. So they have all of a sudden in 1919 has uh, made an operation against the Ottoman uh, territories to the Western Anatolia, as you know. And then the Black Sea was given by the British to the Pontus and the Greek people living there. And then the Eurasia given to the Armenians to establish uh, uh, Kilikia, Prince, and blah, blah. So the, Brit the British authorities have had no expense, spent no money, spent no logistics, spent no military force, but uh, had a wall, had a security wall up. What about the down? What about the security line down in the Mediterranean? It is still on progress. That is the border of Europe today. And uh, what we see down the wall in the Mediterranean is the source of the terrorism 
is the source of the chaotic atmosphere, is the source of the terrorist activities, is the source of the uh, immigration and everything the uh, modern Europe and the US never enjoy. So, so 1878 is uh, once more very important for the history, but we should, we should enlarge our mind and panoramic view to see and to understand what is happening there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, this Peter. is the aircraft, like the Cyprus, the, like the aircraft basis. Yeah, yeah 50, 50 aircraft uh, carrier today. Evet. Yes, the Ergun Demiral, can I, uh, I can ask this question, a little question to the uh, associated uh, Ergun Demiral. Uh, how can uh, we Professor get the lessons Deniz, today? Deniz, can you hear me? Deniz, yes, hear me? finish. I think finish. Finishing, I think. I, I, I just we need to remind you that we are, we are off time. Okay, so, thank you very uh, much. You are welcome. And I, thank you very much for your contributions and your questions. As far as I can see, there is no more questions. So thank you very much for your participation, for your interest in session one. We are now stopping for the morning session, and we are going to have a lunch break till 1.30 local time. At 1.30, we will meet for the afternoon sessions, and we will start with our second keynote speaker and go through sessions two and three, which will be followed by a closing remark session. So thank you very much for your participation. Enjoy your lunch.